Uh, I am truly, truly delighted to be here for many reasons, one of which that property, I realize the issue of property, the topic of property, was the passion that ignited my questioning, my career, and everything I have done since a uh, few years ago. I was uh, working with Mona as, as my student uh, at, at MIT. Um, I have moved in the last 15, 20 years away from property and planning issues. But it is property, I think, and the questions that, that I had to deal with early as a student that got me to um, realize how important interdisciplinary work is in this field and perhaps in many other fields. And this is why um, I think that uh, Professor Blomley's work um, is really incredibly useful. And at the time I was writing my stuff, I hadn't seen uh, any of his work. I was writing the late 80s, early 90s, and um, I, I realized that there was something missing. And if you allow me, I'll just uh, tell you my narrative about how this issue came up, how the importance of interdisciplinary work on property for planners became such an important piece of, of, of my intellectual uh, growth, if you will. You know, when I was a student, I finished engineering, I went into planning. I'm from Jordan, I went back to Jordan, worked in, over the summer for the Ministry of Planning, and they said, they showed me these maps where, you know, east of Amman was vacant land to be developed for new suburbs. And we had these maps and we went out to the eastern suburbs of Amman to develop this empty, you know, it, it, it looked beautiful on these blueprints, and we were thinking about where would be the industrial zones, the uh, uh, residential, commercial, and what have you. And to my surprise, it was the first time I go there, the whole place was inhabited and, and, and built, <laughs> built up completely. And at the end of the day, I came back and I said, are we sure these are maps for that area? And they said, yes, they are. And indeed, in terms of property rights, this was public state land. In reality, it was tribal domains that had been used historically as grazing land, herding, and then as it became closer and closer to urban areas, it got urbanized. And I realized that there is an issue here that I needed to understand as a planner so that I figured out how how do, how do we intervene in a situation like this? We cannot keep doing, doing these plans as if there are no people on, on the ground. That's when I pursued my master's in urban planning. And even then, I was frustrated because economists would tell you that there is no such thing as markets and exchange is based on property rights. If you don't have property rights, you don't have markets. And yet, in that part that I, of Amman that I revisited again and again, this was the most thriving real estate market, all informal, with all sorts of, with all sorts of guarantees and market arrangements. There was a contract that said, your satisfaction guaranteed or your money back, <laughs> basically. These were informal arrangements when you, there was no title deed involved that allowed people to exchange. So it, it really begged the question, how can this happen without property rights? And why is it happening without property rights? And what, uh, what were the mechanisms and what were the narratives uh, that, that were uh, uh, being used? And how do people legitimize uh, this? We all know that there is markets in, in stolen products. You know, in, in Jordan, we have Sul Haramiyya. I'm sure here somewhere you have, you know, you, you get things. To, but when you have land and property and apartments and stuff, long-term uh, permanent goods, you know, how does this happen? And I realized that we really need to move out of the narrow 
disciplinarian or disciplinary fields to understand anthropology, history, law, geography, planning, uh, politics, and all of that. And I ended up having, at the time, being forced to come up with, with formulations that open up the box of property rights to allow for phenomena that wasn't just happening east of Amman. The more I read, the more we realized that whether it's in Latin America or Africa or, or Indonesia or Europe, whether it's squatter housing or uh, military juntas taking over farmers' land or you know, these power relations were, you know, all sorts of manifestations. And I started thinking that we, we need to talk about property relations, how property relations evolve. A piece of it was property rights, but property rights are a contested field. It's not just something that, that the state and law decides on. It is a contested field. And it is contested from the empirical work that I was doing by two other pieces. One was property claims, because people can, you, so you have property rights. This is sort of the domain of the state and uh, what the state says is, is, is a property right and who has it and the relationships within that. But then you have property claims, narratives. In Jordan, the tribes said, we were here before the state. So we are, you know, so they told all sorts of stories about how that land actually belonged to them and was not public land. And in, in urban areas, in Chinatown, in tenants who have been there for a long time, uh, uh, homesteaders, uh, uh, all, you have stories about how these people have claims regardless of what the state says about property rights. So you have that. And then you have property status, which essentially reflects people's ability to act on the ground and creates fact on the, create fa facts on the ground. And then over time, with, with the claims they have, inter, uh, interact in a dynamic way to, uh, to, to affect the ultimate property rights uh, uh, that take place. Um, and that's what got me to realize that um, the, the construct of property rights is very limiting and actually serves a very small, powerful elite in many of the uh, um, contexts that, that we look at. And if it is, if, if, if we are looking at states that are overwhelmingly not democratic, using the concept of property rights, then it is only it is incumbent upon us to start developing the language, the, uh, the terms that justify and give space for people contesting the officialdom uh, space and, and the narrative of the state that if it's a property right, you have to respect it. Now, I'll end with where I think the challenge is because um, as, as, um, as, as Nicholas said, this notion of highest and best use is, the, is, is sort of becomes the, uh, the moral equivalent of what we all, you know, it's the God that we pray to is the highest and best use. And what that does, in essence, is, is creates ex exclusion based on price. So, uh, the urban space, or any space for that matter, becomes uh, those who get it are only those who are able to pay a higher price and be, be owners. And if they are owners, they have a voice. And they have, uh, if they are not owners, they have, they have no voice. This is definitely um, uh, a, a, uh, a story or a narrative that needs to be challenged and challenged by planners and activists, uh, I think, because if, even if we think of the city from, a, from, a, uh, from an economic perspective, the wealth of the city, the value added of the city is produced by all those who are in it, by the policemen, by the workers, by the city workers, by the teachers, 
these are the people who make the city a livable place. By what moral justification do we say the value added is uh, expropriated, is taken by those who own the property? So there is this price exclusion which needs to be uh, problematized. There is also other, all the exclusions that we all know too well, the spatial exclusion through land use and, 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 and standards and zoning. There is the legal uh, exclusion when we create a private property over what used to be a common property or open property. There are, of course, the ethnic, racial, confessional, what have you, exclusions that societies create. And, um, and finally, and most importantly, and most devastating for the concept of social justice, there is the exclusion from opportunities that people have uh, as a result of these other exclusions. And I always wonder, you know, by what right? We know that, for instance, rural urban migration is a phenomena all over the world. And rural urban migration is created by a push and a pull factor. Cities pull, always, by nature. Cities will pull because of the opportunities they create. But it is the state and state policy that is responsible for the push that happens in rural areas. The fact that in rural areas you don't have the adequate health or education standards to give people equal opportunity is what pushes people out of rural areas into cities. So we need to ask the moral question about migration and to what extent the state has a responsibility to accommodate the people who are being pushed out of, by policy, pushed out of uh, uh, rural areas into, uh, into urban areas. Now there is another dimension of migration that Lebanon and Jordan are experiencing and when we're talking about cross-border, cross international, uh, forced migration uh, in our case uh, from, from Syria. Other countries, of course, in Europe have, have uh, U.S. face these questions. These are also deeply moral questions about um, the, the flow not only of capital, the, the, we talk about the free, free flow of capital, but we are very hesitant when we talk about, when, when we talk about the free flow of human beings after one, uh, following the, the, the capital that, that moves around. Um, so in conclusion, I think, uh, as, as Nicholas very aptly put it in, in his writings and in today's presentation, planners have an important role to play, very important role to play, uh, in answering the question of how do we move from an immoral, in my view, notion of highest and best use to a notion about uh, a, a moral economy construct or a debate or a space for, for uh, deciding on how do you uh, create a moral economy that actually gives back uh, the, 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 the product, the value added, this, the, the opportunities that every member of a city and then every member of a state um, uh, are, um, are entitled to. And really, uh, land use and planning and property are at the heart of that question. Thank you very much. And thank you, Nicholas and Muna, for bringing me back to this issue.